Welcome to the Moved to Meditate podcast. I'm your host, Addie DeHilster. This is a place for vibrant discussions about mindfulness, movement practices, and ways to find more balance and presence in daily life. Here, you'll find resources to help you progress on your path, as well as insightful conversations with mindful movement, yoga, meditation, and Dharma teachers from a range of traditions. On this podcast, we spotlight embodied approaches to mindfulness and the more contemplative aspects of movement practice. Listen in and connect to a community of like-minded practitioners. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the podcast. Have you ever wondered what the difference is between a mindful movement class and a yoga class? That question is a little more complicated than it may first appear, and so that's what we're going to explore today. I really appreciate you joining me for a discussion on this topic. It's kind of personal to me as I've thought about this question a lot. I wrote and rewrote this episode a whole bunch, and the best way to stop rewriting it is to sit here and record it, especially so I can turn my fan back on since it's one of the hottest days this summer. (laughs) But I digress. I've thought about this question so much because of the directions that I've been evolving in my teaching in the last few years. So I'm hoping that what I share in this episode will be helpful, whether you're newly exploring movement practices or you're a teacher like myself who sometimes gets all tangled up in names and titles for things. If this topic does resonate with you or if you have another perspective, I would love to hear your thoughts. You can always contact me with questions, feedback, or requests at mail at movedtomeditate.com. There are also a few past episodes on different aspects of defining mindful movement kind of related to this. So be sure to scroll through the list on whatever podcast app you use or check the show notes for this episode where I'll link to some relevant suggestions for further inspiration. And if you like this podcast, I would so love it if you could take the time to go and write a review on Apple Podcasts or share this on your social media. This is how we find more cool people to talk about cool stuff with. We have to share what we're into to start a conversation, right? Okay, on that note, let's dig into today's conversation on this question of what is a mindful movement class versus a yoga class? And what might these terms tell us? Is there a difference between a yoga class and a mindful movement class? Sometimes yes. Sometimes maybe that difference doesn't matter so much. A yoga class could in fact be a type of mindful movement class because that is a very broad term. Some yoga teachers actually prefer to use the term mindful movement because they found that their potential students hear it as less intimidating than, quote, yoga, which unfortunately brings up a lot of images of extreme bendiness and athleticism for a lot of people. I've also heard that organizations like schools sometimes prefer the term mindful movement rather than yoga, even if the movements are mostly yoga based, because to them it sounds more secular, which we could do a whole other podcast episode just to unpack that logic (laughs) and whether it should be that way. So what I can offer is my perspective and how I'm using these terms. And what I'd like to focus on here is the mindful movement class as a particular format that I use in my teaching that gives structure to the practice of mindfulness in movement. And it's a little bit different from the typical yoga class that you can find out there in the world, or even many of the yoga classes that I have taught in my career. If you're newer to all of this, maybe these points will help you find the kind of class you're looking for, or at least gain a better understanding of what's available and what you might get out of different kinds of classes. I also thought it would be interesting to talk about because I'm hearing from more and more of you who are both meditation practitioners and also yoga or movement teachers who wonder about how to bring it all together because it's not always obvious. Or maybe you're teaching outside of the yoga studio environment and you're wondering how to translate the practice that you're familiar with into a different form that might not adhere to all the rules of what a yoga class is supposed to look like. <laughs> 
Before I get too much further, I just want to reiterate that I'm not claiming that this is the way to teach mindful movement. It's me sharing my approach. It is grounded in about 14 years of teaching and thinking about movement and mindfulness and an even longer time as a practitioner. But I absolutely acknowledge that there could be lots of ways to define and structure a mindful movement class. Let's start with some similarities. In a yoga class or a mindful movement class, there would be elements of conscious movement and restful stillness across the board in both kinds of class. And generally, both a yoga class and a mindful movement session would both begin and end reverently with some kind of opportunity to slow down and check in with yourself before you start the practice and before you move on from the practice. Both might offer the opportunity to reflect on your intention or to focus on a wholesome quality or an aspiration of some kind. And both can certainly contribute to stress relief and well-being and offer the many physiological benefits of gentle exercise and movement. The idea of a mindful movement class is less standardized than what you might expect from a yoga class. It can range in length and it can vary based on who's participating and where the class is taking place. It could be a lunchtime movement break at the office to help people shake off some stress and get out of their heads for a while. It could be a community practice under the trees at a local park. It could be a 15-minute movement break during a meditation class that helps the teacher offer a kinesthetic experience of the mindfulness principles that they're teaching. Or it could be a series of movements guided by a therapist who's helping their client process their experiences more somatically. Or it could be a full-length studio-style group class that combines movement and meditation as a form of embodied self-care. I've taught in quite a few of these environments myself, and sometimes it's been called yoga, sometimes it's been called mindful movement. Confusing, right? (laughs) Whatever the context might be, there are some common features that I think of when structuring a class that I'm going to call mindful movement. Some of these might apply pretty consistently across different mindful movement classes, and some are more related to my own interests and experiences. So here's some features of my mindful movement classes. I'm going to give you six of these and talk about each of them a little bit. So firstly, the mindful movement class doesn't necessarily follow the same movement arc as a yoga class. A yoga class, unless it's chair yoga, usually starts on the floor, either seated or lying down on a mat, or sometimes in child's pose, maybe. And then it moves towards maybe seated or tabletop poses, up to sun salutations and or the more active standing poses, inversions and such. And then it winds back down to the floor for Shavasana, the final resting pose. There is a lot of variation within that. I'm super simplifying that. (laughs) But the pattern of that arc is pretty traditional and expected within a yoga class. A mindful movement class, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily involve visiting all of these same positional locations. It could be entirely standing movements followed by walking meditation. Or it could be entirely seated in a chair, including the movements and the meditation. It could be all lying down, including somatic exercises, gentle stretches, and a reclining meditation. Or it could be a mix of all these different options. And it would just depend on who the class is for and where it's being taught. But there's not that same expectation of where the class will begin and end, like, positionally. Okay, second feature, I would say in a mindful movement class, the movements might be drawn from multiple modalities and not purely a traditional sequence of yoga poses or not only a set of qigong forms, but maybe a combination of influences. If it was all yoga or all qigong, you'd probably just call it that, right? (laughs) My mindful movement classes often include big doses of somatic exercises that complement the gentle yoga poses I offer, but technically those come from Hannah Somatics and Feldenkrais, not yoga. And alongside the standing yoga poses, like the warriors and the balance poses, I love to include some of my favorite Qigong flows. I choose movements from different styles and movement languages because I believe they each have important things to teach us. They have different ways of engaging us. The somatics are really specific, subtle micro-movements. 
The Qigong flows are graceful, repetitive flows that allow us to drop in to breath and movement. Some yoga movements do that too. And the poses from yoga can also help us open up to sensation and aliveness in parts of the body we weren't very connected with before. Each type of movement can help us connect with the body in different ways or to express different qualities like stability, power, fluidity, softness, sturdiness, lightness, balance, or subtlety. I did an episode about a year ago that went into detail on what each of these modalities has brought to my mindfulness and embodiment journey. So if you want to hear more about that, look up episode 45, which I called Exploring Movement Modalities Through a Mindfulness Lens. And I'll link to that in the show notes too. I also choose across modalities to maximize the accessibility of the practice because altogether they really expand my repertoire. They offer a multitude of ways to say, do a twist, whether seated, standing, or lying down, or to circle the shoulders in different ways, some of which work for different students in different positions for different reasons in different locations. (laughs) And this broader movement language helps me to get creative and keep the practice appropriate for people without always having to use so many yoga props, which would often be necessary to facilitate sticking with a more traditional asana sequence or teaching something like accessible sun salutations. In some of the environments I teach in, we don't necessarily have all the yoga props we would need to do that. Or when I'm teaching people online, which is most of what I do, I I don't always know what the heck props they might have at home or not have. So the third possible difference between mindful movement class and a yoga class is about sequencing, which is how you design a class and put the movements together in a deliberate order. In a mindful movement class, my sequencing is not really based on the yogic model, which maybe you could guess since I'm drawing upon movements from multiple modalities already. In a more traditional yoga class, depending on the lineage that you're trained in, you might do things in a certain order for energetic reasons or because of Ayurveda or to warm up and prepare the body for more challenging poses towards the peak of the class. And there are certain traditional guidelines about when you do back bends versus forward bends versus twists and etc. If you study different movement modalities, you'll find that they all have different theories and approaches to sequencing. And when I look at it through the lens of movement as a form of mindfulness meditation practice, that leads me to sequence my class based more on a nervous system journey that might involve discharging excess agitation and restlessness. So deepening of presence is possible and the stillness comes more easily. The class might also be organized around illustrating a particular mindfulness skill or theme, like, for example, learning to recognize feeling tone reactions of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, which we can explore in movement, then apply in meditation. That's the second foundation of mindfulness. And so my choices in terms of what movements are included and in what order are shaped, not by the traditional sequencing rules, but by my sense of what kind of nervous system support is needed, and what mindfulness lesson or experience we are trying to invite through the movements. Okay, number four, in a mindful movement class that really centers mindfulness, there is more emphasis on what's happening with your awareness and your attention than what's taught in most mainstream yoga classes. I know that there are some yoga teachers who do teach more mindfully, and I see you, I appreciate you. It is definitely not always the priority. (laughs) It's definitely not what most yoga teachers are trained in. So to call a class mindful movement could be one way of indicating that there will be more emphasis on the mindfulness part. That would include more instructions on how to bring your attention to the present moment through different anchors or focal points, more reminders to notice mind wandering and come back to the present. It would also include more space for observing the thought patterns that do arise, as well as the emotions and reactions that might be showing up as you go through the movements. Generally, this kind of class is also going to point more often to interoceptive experience, which is your awareness of the body from the inside out, and not just focus on the proprioceptive experience, which is more about positioning and form. 
So you're going to hear a lot more instructions in the form of a question like, what are you noticing right now? Or what sensations are showing up in the back body in this movement? Just as an example, these are not meant to elicit a right answer, but to get you looking, to encourage your observation. And that's very different from being in a class where the instructions are more prescriptive, like feel that stretch in your hamstrings, which may or may not be relevant for everyone, or where the instructions are more geared towards perfect positioning, like Turn your feet so that they line up with the outer edge of the mat. Now step back so that the inner arch of your back foot lines up with your front heel. Then bend your front knee 90 degrees over your ankle and inhale, raising your arms overhead. That was warrior one. Without a lot of opportunity to pause and notice how any of those instructions actually feel, not saying it's bad, but there's not a lot of room for adjustment, individuality, or interoceptive awareness of sensations in there. So. In mindful movement, we're really interested in how we're paying attention and what we're paying attention to. The fifth part of what I mean when I call my class mindful movement has to do with the history and roots of mindfulness. Of course, mindfulness is part of yoga, and meditation is a major part of the yoga tradition. But what we generally call mindfulness meditation in the West, and what I've been trained in, and Where I found the most guidance in terms of mindfulness techniques and conceptual pathways and community comes from a Buddhist source, or really Buddhist sources. Historically, the yogic and Buddhist traditions intertwine. They have a lot in common, but Buddhism is distinct from yoga, and I want to honor both traditions by being clear on what I am drawing from philosophically Because when I'm teaching mindfulness, I am drawing most heavily on my Buddhist training. And that's what I'm exploring through mindful movement. That connection is important for me to name, but it's not to downplay that there is mindfulness inherent in the yoga tradition or in the Taoist practices too, like Qigong and Tai Chi. But for me, my mindful movement is like a dynamic form of my Buddhist meditation practice. This does not mean you have to identify as Buddhist to do mindful movement or mindfulness meditation. But it helps if you're open to the ideas and at least willing to acknowledge the cultures and the tradition that developed these practices. Okay, number six, the last possible difference between a mindful movement class and a yoga class is that a mindful movement class might end in seated meditation instead of shavasana. If the idea of the class is that the movements are both a preparation for and an extension of the meditation, It makes sense to culminate the class with a formal meditation practice. If it were a yoga class, it would be totally scandalous to not end with Shavasana. That rest time is priceless and valuable and a very important part of a yoga sequence. It is absolutely part of what makes it a yoga class. I know I wouldn't be happy if I went to a yoga class that didn't have Shavasana at the end, okay? (laughs) But a mindful movement session may have a different intention, a different framework, a different class title and expectation, and in that case, it's valid to choose a meditation there for the end of class. And I'm not talking about the very brief one-minute meditation after Shavasana that you'll often see (laughs) as a yoga class is wrapping up. I'm talking about a more substantial meditation period. For me, it might be 15 to 20 minutes of meditation after the mindful movements, or the class might be 50-50 movement and meditation. As a side note, to complicate things again, mindfulness meditation can also be done lying down. So that final meditation could look a whole lot like Shavasana if done in a reclining position. It could be silent or guided, but the meditator would be encouraged to work with a mindfulness technique like a breath anchor or a body scan, or maybe use loving kindness phrases, essentially to do a meditation in that position. So those are my six kind of elements of what I think might be the difference between a mindful movement class and a yoga class. And to talk about this topic of a mindful movement class versus a yoga class from my perspective kind of involves a little bit of the backstory on how my practice and teaching have evolved. The topic is personal to me as someone who cares a lot about these practices. I've thought about this a lot. And for some of my students who've been practicing with me for years, they know me as a yoga teacher and yoga therapist, but one that's always had a strong mindfulness emphasis. 
I'm not sure how much those students have tracked this shift, but what's happened over time is just kind of a flip in what's centered in my classes. Now the mindfulness teaching is the priority and the therapeutic health benefits come alongside that. They're not really separate, but it's kind of a matter of what gets the most airtime. For example, I might still do a whole class or series focusing on one area of the body and explore all kinds of mobility and strength and beneficial movements for that area. But I would position that whole exploration within a framework of mindful embodiment. First and foremost, we're getting to know that area of the body without expectation, learning to feel it more clearly, discerning what those sensations tell us, and observing our mental activity around that. That's all mindfulness of the body, the first foundation of mindfulness. But it's also quite healthy and therapeutic and sometimes pain relieving because when the brain senses the body more accurately, it tends to interpret signals better, create more coordinated movement, more capacity in movement, and fewer warning signals that we might interpret as pain. So those physical benefits might not be the center stage in my class, but they're still there and maybe even enhanced by the mindfulness teachings. So why talk about this? Does the terminology matter? <laughs> I believe it does because it connects with our intentions. I still love yoga and want to respect the yoga tradition, which is part of why I'm differentiating my mindful movement classes from the framework of a yoga class. It's not to put down yoga classes or say something is missing from them or that mindful movement is better. It's just a way of acknowledging that what I'm doing nowadays is not fully traditional under the big umbrella that is yoga. There's still a lot of overlap. Yoga is present in my classes, but if you want traditional yoga, there are other teachers who are really steeped in yoga philosophy and asana yogic meditation and pranayama that you can practice with. Given that I tend to incorporate a broader range of movement modalities beyond yoga, especially somatic exercise and qigong, it doesn't seem accurate to just call my class yoga anymore, and I don't want to further confuse the question of what yoga is, because there's enough of that going around. But it's not random that I've integrated all these different forms. It's because I love what they contribute to a moving mindfulness practice. And I've also wanted to more clearly name the Buddhist teachings that heavily inform my approach to movement, particularly the Satipatthana Sutta, or Four Foundations of Mindfulness. I want to honor both traditions by being clear on what I'm drawing from. So mindful movement it is. As I mentioned, the term mindful movement is pretty general and it's used in a lot of ways. Looking at the more familiar yoga class format gives us something to compare and contrast it with, which I think makes it less abstract. So I hope this has given you some food for thought and maybe a way of considering the possibilities and what kinds of classes might serve you best. Thanks so much for listening, for going along on this journey with me, and feel free to email me or find me on social media if you want to talk more about this or share something about this topic. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Be well until next time. So that's today's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with a friend, subscribe on YouTube, or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and help others find it that way. To learn more about my work, the Moves to Meditate class library, courses, or teacher trainings, go to movedtomeditate.yoga. This is Addie D. Hilster. Thanks so much for listening.